Good morning, boys and girls. How you doing? Who has school started already? Who's in school now? I'm in first grade. First grade? I'm in second. Second grade? Ooh. So what are you doing in class today or the other day? You mean your friends again? Just nothing? Just say hi to everybody? On the 4th? Oh, you get after Labor Day. Lucky. Boys and girls, I got a question for you all. What does a person need to live? Food. Love. And Water. And shelter. shelter. What's a shelter? And like a roof over your head so you don't get rained on? And a house. 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 Yes, and a house, and, right? And furniture. And furniture. <laughs> I like furniture in my house, too. And Boys and girls, can you do something with me? There's something else we need to live. Can you... Can you breathe in? Everyone go... Hold it, and then breathe out. I can hold it for What is that? You're breathing, right? Do you need to breathe to live? So I got a question. Who gives you the breath you breathe? God does. Everything we have comes from God. Who gives the food that we have to eat? God does. Or the water, or the shelter over our head, or our families. Who gives us these things? God does. Boys and girls, in Sunday school today, you're going to hear a story about a prophet named Elijah who did his ministry during a famine. Do you girls know what the word famine means? Hmm, anyone know what the word famine means? I do. What does it mean? It means... I don't know. It means there's no food. What happens if you, if you, what happens if you can't eat anything? Uh, you go to a new land. You starve and then you die, right? So there's a big famine in the land and everyone's scared. There's no food That's left. What, that's what daddy said. Yes. So God tells Elijah, I want you to go to a town and you're going to talk to a widow and that widow's going to give you food to eat because there's no food left. So Elijah, girls, let's look. So Elijah goes to the town and he goes to the widow and says, could you give me something to eat? And you know what the widow says? This is all I have left. I don't have any food. What is this? Not sugar. It looks like sugar. Flour. What's flour used for? For, for pizza and different things. For what? Muffins? For bread. Is there much flour in here? No. There has to be a lot of flour. There's got to be a lot of flour. Do you think this could feed many people? No. The widow said, this is all I have left to eat. I don't have enough to give you food. But Elijah said, trust in God. Because does God give people food? Yes. Yes. Trust in God. So go and make bread for me and your family. So that's what the widow does. She uses the rest of this flour. Boys and girls, let's listen. She uses the rest of this flour. And then she gives Elijah the food. And oh, the flour's gone, right? Well, she looks back at the jar. You know what she sees? The flower's back! What happened? Yeah, huh? And run away from And so the widow, she makes more bread. Oh, this is the last day. This is definitely going to run out this time. So she takes the flour, and she puts it in the oven, and she makes bread. And after she makes the bed, she, bread, she looks at the, the jar again, and what does she see? The yogurt! The, the, the flower's still there! Isn't that a puzzle? Because it's, like, it's going in. Ooh! It's just reforming it sounds impossible, right? It's like duplicating. What could be happening here? I have no idea. Hmm, who could be making flour enter the jar? Daddy! God. God, our dad, right? God, our father. And so, does God give the widow food? Yes. Does God give Elijah food? Yes. Yes. Willow, God gives us everything we need, too. Because what the story tells us, does God provide us for food? Does God give us house and home? Alan, does that God give you family and friends? God gives us everything we need because he's our father and he loves us. Amen? An idea at that one yeah. time. All right, boys and girls, we're going to pray. Do you remember how we pray? D, D, D. 
Before we do that, Isabel, we're going to fold our hands and bow our heads and you repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for for caring for us. us. Help us to remember remember that we have a good Father who provides for us and gives us us everything we need. need. In Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen. And boys and girls, how do we end? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please walk. We're going to... Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you are familiar with the Bible, then you know that the Apostle Paul is so very important in our church's history. You know that half of our New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul. There's a good chance that when you walk through these doors, you are going to be hearing or reading words from Paul's pen over 2,000 years after they were written. God's word to us through Paul. And if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that Paul's ministry was not all fun and games and fame and fortune. Actually, quite the opposite. We hear that Paul was persecuted and suffered for the message of Jesus for his faith. He was tortured. He was thrown in jail. The church fathers say up to seven times. Paul, when he went from city to city, he didn't have to look for a hotel to stay in because he would say a few words of Jesus and he would be yanked into prison. He'd be given a room in a jail cell. In fact, one crazy story... I don't know if you know this one. In the Bible, we hear that Paul, he's preaching and teaching the word of Jesus to anyone who would hear the words of eternal life. And the Jewish leaders wanted nothing to do with him, rejected him. Heresy, they say, and the punishment for heresy is death. So they rile up the crowds and they drag him by the robes and throw him outside the city. And they pick up stones and they throw stones at him until he's not moving anymore. And they tire themselves out and look at him and his body is motionless. All right, he's dead. Good job, everyone. Let's go have dinner. And then some time passes and Paul's followers, they go to get his body probably to bury it. But God wasn't done with Paul yet. As soon as they get close, what happens? Paul jumps up. Well, I'm still alive. And he goes right back in the city to continue preaching the news of Jesus. Whoa! Even through all this persecution, Paul still had a mission given by God. And it's because God protected Paul that day that we have what we heard today this morning in Ephesians. We have the letters of God to us. God chose Paul so that we might hear this very, very important word. So let's go through it again. If you want to open it, we're going to go through Ephesians, our epistle lesson. And I give you that prologue about the suffering at the hands of men towards Paul for this reason. You would think Paul, with his his experience of persecution, would tell Christians, Hey, watch out! If you talk about Jesus, they're going to stone you. If you talk about Jesus, you're going to lose your reputation. They're going to mock you, reject you. But that's not what Paul writes. That third line there of our epistle lesson. Paul writes, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. In other words, our enemy is not those who throw stones at us. We don't need to fear man at all. What? How on earth could that possibly be? Well, you've been paying attention to my sermons in the last few months. You know that you have been given something that no one, not one person can take away from you. No harsh stone, no threat of death, no word of mockery can take what you have been given away from you by Jesus. And what is that? 
but faith which leads to everlasting life. Scott, can any man take that away from you? The faith you've been given? Not a chance. And so Paul says, fear not people who stone you or mock you or reject you. Rather, he goes on, maybe there is someone we should watch out for. He goes, rather against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul says, fear not man who can only kill you, but you got ever, ever, everlasting life in store. Rather, watch out for the one who knows what you have. Watch out for the devil who would like nothing more than for you to give up that faith you have been given. Satan would love to give you all the comforts of this world so that you give up faith in Jesus. Anything. He gives you permission to live however you would like so that you reject Jesus. This is not how Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Do you remember this story? Satan put him on a tall mountain, a tall tower. I will give you all the world, all the comfort, all the power and authority. Just bow down and worship me, Jesus. Give up your place in heaven. Well, Jesus, he's God, could easily skirt by that temptation. But does the devil tempt us with the things of the world? This is what Jesus says in our gospel. Listen, watch out for these things. Things that come out of the heart of man. Things that maybe feel really good to have. But are nonetheless evil. Evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Satan would love for you to have these things. Take whatever you want. Just leave that little, little, little thing that doesn't really matter. Uh, your faith in Jesus with me. Should we watch out against the temptation for the world to do this? Paul says, yes. So how do we do this? We put on the armor of God. What does Paul say in Ephesians? The armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith. All these things have been given to us by God. We put our righteousness on? No, rather God's righteousness for us. Do we put our truth on? No, rather God's truth for us. Are we blocking the arrows of the devil by our own faith? Rather the faith that God has given us. And then my favorite, the most famous from this passage... The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The armor of God, what is armor for? To protect you, right? It's defensive. But we might feel tired of being defensive all the time. And when are we going to get a chance to fight back against the world? Fight back against evil and Satan? So maybe, oh, God gives us a sword. The sword of the Spirit to fight back. Maybe that's the way we can have our offensive well, maybe not. Back when I was in seminary, I had a friend. Uh, I would classify him as a sword guy. You know guys like this? Marshall, do you have any friends that like, they'll collect daggers or something and like put it on their wall? No, you don't. I, I, he's a sword guy, right? He would love to research about Roman gear and equipment and, and weaponry. And he would tell me all the time, Peter, 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 Paul, when he was talking about swords, he was imagining the Roman guard at the time. And the Roman guards, they had swords about this long. Would you classify this as a very long sword? Not really, just like an arm length, right? You, not a lot of reach in, in combat. So rather, this sword that the Roman guard would often be equipped with would be primarily for defense. When someone came at you, it would be a defensive weapon. If the Roman guard went to war, they would often take things like long spears. This was once a shepherd's crook and I broke it, so now I'm using it as a, as a spear. <laughs> long spear. <laughs> Compare this to the sword I just held up. Uh, maybe triple, quadruple the length? More for offensive. Or as a javelin, you grab it and you, and you throw it. 
uh, from a distance. Or sometimes the Roman guard would have bows to shoot flaming arrows from far away. Does Paul give us a bow in this analogy? Who gets the bow in the, the letter to the Ephesians? Satan is the one shooting at us. He is the one attacking us. Rather, the weaponry we get, the armor we get, is all for defense. We live in such an evil, broken world. And it can be tempting to think, we need to stand up and fix the world. It's our job. But remember, the war we see is not ours. It's God's. And by the blood of Jesus, God will be victorious over the devil once and for all. So we need not fear persecution. Rather, our role in this war is solely defensive, solely putting on the armor of God that we might be, t be protected by God's love, that we may endure. So let me close with this. How does this all apply to us? What does this mean for our lives? It means, brothers and sisters, if we are in the middle of a war, God's war, which he will be victorious, and God has given us armor to protect us, and a shield of faith to block the flaming darts of the devil, don't drop your shield. How crazy would it be to be taking off armor in the middle of a war, or taking off your shoes in the middle of a marathon? And yet so many people do this. You see examples of this all the time. You come to church. It's a little bit hard to come to church the next week, so you skip a week. And that one week turns to two weeks. And that two weeks turns to a month. And the month turns to six months. And the six months turns into ten years. And you slowly drop your shields. Thinking, I'll be okay. I'm fine. I don't need to, I don't need to be a part of this. And when we drop our shield, who do we give an opening to strike us with his darts? Satan. And Paul says, watch out for that. Rather, stay strong. Keep the shield up. Continue to come back here week after week that you might be defended against the lies of the devil you hear over and over and over again. We stand strong with the armor of God with us and we never drop our shield we come here over and over paul says we are persistent in prayer we pray for each other that we may endure to the last day because we know what's going to happen on the last day we will not be on the losing side will we christ will be victorious forever and ever this is what we are called to do brothers and sisters Put on the armor of God. Fear not man. Fear not evil. Fear not the way our world is going or the country, how anti-Christian it is becoming or maybe mockery or a lesser reputation we might have or a fear to talk about our faith openly. Fear not these things for man cannot take away that gift you've been given. Rather, fear the evil one and come here in his sanctuary. We put on the armor of God and we arm ourselves with the sword of the Spirit, the very Word of God, that we may endure, persevere until that last day when we see our Lord Jesus, King, Conqueror, forever and ever. In His holy and precious name. Amen. We continue our worship with our...